We have Kirsty Whittle, who is a community archaeologist and has been studying the, the bullring and the, there's a mound very close by it which has had some interesting research done on it, which Kirsty is going to tell us a bit more about. So thank you very much, Kirsty. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, first and foremost, you'll have to forgive me. I am extremely nervous. I'm not a very good um, public speaker, so if I go too fast or if I'm mumbling, then please shout up and let me know. Um, <laughs> okay, um, I've recently graduated from the University of Manchester where I was studying archaeology, and for my dissertation, I studied the um, the barrow which is adjoining the bull ring, which is just outside, I'm sure you all know. Um, for it, I did a geophysical survey, which consisted of a resistivity survey, and I'll go through those results with you now. Um, the aim of the study was to look at the construction of the mound that's adjoining the bull ring. Um, it is scheduled as being an oval barrow superimposed onto a bowl barrow. Oval barrows are nationally important as there are only 50 examples of, of oval barrows in the country. Okay, so I think this one's a bit of a rhetorical question. What is a henge monument? If, if you're not sure, you can just pop outside and have a look. It's, um, I'm also covering what is, what is a barrow, which is a slightly more difficult question. And then finally, the research question that led me to do the, the geophysical study in the first place. So what is a henge monument? It's, it's an earthwork which is an archaeological feature created out of earth. It typically has a bank and a ditch. There are two types of henge monuments uh, which relate to the entrances, believe it or not. So there's a type 1 henge monument which has a single entrance and a type 2 henge monument which has two entrances. All henge monuments are nationally important. So with the bull ring, this is a lovely topographical image of the bull ring there. It has the bank, it has the ditch, it is a type 2 because it has two entrances, it's a Neolithic henge monument and it is a nationally important one. So what is a barrow? Now a barrow is a form of burial mound. There's many varieties of them, as there could be up to 10 different varieties of, of barrows. Um, the ones here are suggested as being an oval barrow and a round barrow. So my research question, and the question that I put forward before I did the geophysical study, was what can a geophysical study of the mound adjoining the bullring tell us about the mound's construction? The aim of that was to see whether it is two barrows, one superimposed onto the other, or if it is a single barrow, or if it is either. Geophysical studies are a non-intrusive survey. I uh, have two main types of geophysical study, one of which is resistivity and the other one is magnetometry. At this point, I'll apologise for any spelling mistakes. <laughs> um, the differences yeah. between the two, uh, with resistivity, it measures the resistance of the surrounding ground and the soil. The more compact it is, which you tend to get with banks and ditches, um, the higher the resistance. With magnetometry, it measures the amount of magnetic activity within the ground. So if it is a very waterlogged site, it'll hold more magnetism. Typically, um, geophysical studies like this would be initially carried out on a 10 by 10 metre grid with one metre transects and a reading per one metre square. However, for the sake of the, the mound, which is outside, it is rather large, so we did a 30 by 30 metre grid with one metre transects and we measured every 0 0.5 metres, so every half metre. Added to the topographical study, it shows the undulations and mainly the ridge and furrow, which is distributed across the site on a whole. So this is the results of the resistivity. Um, as you can see, hugely confusing. <laughs> Not very easy for somebody who doesn't know about it to understand. I can, can assure you, even I have struggled with that. I just, it's difficult. The red area, however, indicates the areas of high resistance. The blue areas indicate in the areas of low resistance. What's fairly interesting about it is you, you would expect where the steeper side is to be fully highly resistant, which is where the red is, but it isn't. The low resistance here in the blue shows the slope going down from it. So you have the, the steep bank and then the slope. The steep bank is highly resistant, whereas the slope is very low resistance, which doesn't really match our characteristics of a barrow, to be honest. 
The dot density graph is it's similar to the, the colour graph, but it, it's just slightly clearer. You can see the distribution of high resistivity material around here and the, the big area of low resistivity area here. The mound itself comes around here like that. So all of this area of low resistivity is actually on the slope of the mound. It's very interesting. One of the reasons for this could have been um, Tristram, who did some work here in 1915, recorded that a slit trench had been dug into the top of the mound and the spoil from that had literally been thrown over their shoulders and thrown down. So it could be that the area of high resistance, where the steeper slope is, is the bit that's still intact, whereas the area of low resistance is the spoil that they throw over the shoulder while digging the ditch. So again, just to, just to cover it, um, the results that we had are not diagnostic of a barrow, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not. It just means that the characteristics that are shown in the resistivity results don't match those that I'm familiar with as being with barrow. The historical evidence um, suggests that there's a possibility that there is, it isn't a barrow. Um, mainly from Tristram, uh, as you put in the slot, he said that the, the mound was chiefly comprised of clay and there's no finds within it. The base area, um, which had the, the slightly higher resistance area, could reflect the ridge and furrow, which is across the site from general wear and tear, really. Um, there is a highly unusual magnetic background to the site as well, which means that using magnetometry is very difficult here. I'm not entirely certain why. Um, however, when the English Heritage did a geophysical study of the, the bullring itself in 2000, they found the same problem. And they couldn't calibrate their magnetometer on site, and nor could I. <laughs> <coughs> so recommendations are, are some of the things that we put forward after doing a study of this type to suggest what should be done with the site in the future. Further in-depth geophysical study of the area of the mound and the area of the bullring will actually give us more indication of what activities have gone on on the site. It will also help us to build an idea of the phasing of construction and the phasing of activities on the site. Trial trenching is possible but not hugely recommended because it is an intrusive method of archaeology and the same with full excavation. Um, trial trenching and full excavation may be done in the instance that geophys and, for example, the magnetometer still don't calibrate and still don't give us enough information. M the more important ones are the long-term management and conservation plans for the site, as I'm sure you're all aware that the site isn't hugely looked after and could maybe benefit from some conservation. Refurbishment of the information, um, which is a little metal placard, perhaps bring that up to date a little bit. And most importantly, community-led conservation and management agreement, which is where the community would agree with the English heritage about how the monument is managed and how the monument is conserved. I absolutely rattled through that because I was unbelievably nervous, but if you've got any questions at all, then please come and see me. I'll just ask you. Yeah, the, the mound. Um, is there, has there been any comparison done with, say, Arbert Lowe's Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you asked that actually. Um, the bull ring and our below seem to be coupled quite often. Um, the problem with that being is the location of Gibb Hill, uh, I'm sure it's Gibb Hill, against our below is actually a significant distance away compared to the one that's here. The size of it is completely different and there's been a lot of comparisons between both henges be with them being so close, pretty much sisters if you will. Um, Looking at the comparisons between the mound here and the mound of Gibb Hill, it's, it's blatantly obvious that it is not the same type of feature. It is a completely different type of feature. So it would need to be looked at properly. Well, similar to that, there's the bowl barrow on the southeast corner of Arbolo, as well, which is right yep. on the edge. Yeah. That, obviously, that's much more typical of the relationship between yeah. the mound and the hedge here. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, that one's more closely related. I mean, the, the, the barrow in that instance is right in the bank of the henge, isn't it? It's, it's very, very close. But again, without us actually having an in-depth look at this, both geophysically and archaeologically, then there's nothing really that we can put forward for comparison until we know those, in, those initial results. Anybody else? Yes? <laughs> Um, this one is a nightmare for magnetometry, I'm not going to lie. Um, the problems with magnetometry is it's a very delicate form of geophys, so it, 
the magnetic fields around the site will change quite often and as such this site in particular has been difficult because of the history of it being um, misused, let's put it, put it that way. Um, Quite a lot of the sites in Derbyshire you do have problems with magnetometry but that's mainly due to the, the acidity of the soil and how well it retains water and things like that. So this one's particularly difficult. Yes? Does the underlying rock here, because you're on a, um, an area that's got granite intrusions here, would that have any effect on the magnetometry? It could have an effect on the magnetometry but only as an underlying factor, not as, not as much as we've had on the site. The, the problems with the magnetometry that we've had on this site has been from recent activity of burnings and things like that which really set it off. Underlying geology always has a problem you know, with, with geophys, but usually there's ways around that, yeah. It, it'll show up as an anomaly rather than as being unable to calibrate it altogether. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Uh, there was an ARCIS survey, which is the University of Sheffield, that was done around this area, which is an evaluation stage one and stage two. So that would be um, geophysical analysis and the landscape survey of the area. But unfortunately, Sheffield unit has closed and I haven't had access to it. Oh, well, ARCIS has closed and I haven't had access to their report. Oops. Yes. Is there any evidence of abatement? Um, there's, there's some evidence, uh, Bateman wrote a book on the antiquities of Derbyshire and he does mention the bull ring in it and the mound, however he didn't actually look into it, he didn't investigate, He's, he stayed with Arbolo and did a lot more work at Arbolo than he did here. It was more so a passing phrase for this one, rather than any firm work. I just feel that he opened a perfect problem for a barrel. He did, yeah he did, he was quite a prolific antiquarian. <laughs> He would have if he had, but um, I guess he thought it wasn't important enough. It's antiquarians. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Um. Although I was dreading that question. <laughs> um, when I was looking for the construction of the mound, I was looking to see if there was evidence of it being a barrow, if it was ev any evidence of it being two barrows, one on top of each other, or if there was no evidence at all. When I said that it was chiefly comprised of clay, that's just the, the, the material that it's made out of. The actual characteristics of it and the way that it's constructed doesn't suggest that it has the characteristics. Exactly, it doesn't have the characteristics of a barrow. Yes? Do you think that the, um, you know, look at the barrow that's on the bank of Arbolo. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that's like a violation. Yeah, it's it's very unusual to have one that close to a bank. I mean, the one at Arbolo is actually in the bank. Um, so I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I would suggest then, in that instance, that for whatever reason, when they placed that there, there was no further use of the Henge monument and they were focusing on the barrow and placing the barrow so that their ancestors were close to a sacred place rather than anything else. Exactly, but it is a very unusual case to have a barrow in the bank. Yes? Uh, there used to be an idea that there was a hinge at Staden just south of Buxton. Has that been keeping it up? I don't know. Uh, honest answer, I don't know. <laughs> it's where focus used to be. Oh, right, I didn't know that. Um, Paul and Vicky Morgan covered that in their book, or covered that in the previous for Cheshire. Um, I, yeah, it is, I think it's well gone. But it is, I think they listed it almost at the fairly much that it was, would have been a henge. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess when it's gone, it's gone, you can't retrieve it. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you. No, it's fine, it's fine. Um, still there in the field behind the industrial estate. Pardon? The monument is still there. The All right. It's behind the actual commercial estate. All oh, right, but it's still there. It's behind the retail estate. <laughs> yes. Pardon? Is there any relationship time-wise between these hinges and wet ribbons on the north of Ian Moore? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, hinges of this type tend to be Neolithic, so there is a possibility there that they are contemporary, but without having a full cross study, you wouldn't be able to tell. 
Anyone else? A community archaeologist. It's an archaeologist who works exclusively and dedicatedly to the community. <laughs> uh, well, my wages come from the Council for British Archaeology. So you work all over, or do you just work particular? Generally in Greater Manchester. Generally. Yes. Is there any relationship between uh, the bull ring and the lows that's around the hills? Again, there could be in. That's a difficult question because that's moving on to like, the landscape archaeology and the wider archaeology of the area. As I'm sure you know, directly next to the Bull Ring is a massive, massive quarry. So a lot of the information that we would have gathered from landscape surveys, from the relationships and intervisibility between sites has been drastically altered, if not completely lost. So um, I, I would hope that at some stage somebody would do a full landscape survey. I'm not giving myself that job because <laughs> it's too much work but I would like to see one done so then we can answer those questions of what the relationships are between sites. Yes. Hey, Kirsty. Yes. The gentleman over here asked what community archaeology is. Yes. Well, are you on Dig Manchester this year, or is it still going on? Ooh, Dig... Kids, or adults, or...? All right, uh, Dig Manchester is a difficult one at the moment. That's one of the projects that we may have in the pipeline in the future. Uh, unfortunately, at this moment, I'm not at liberty to say when. <laughs> Shall we say that just, just come and find Kirsty afterwards yeah. for, for questions? Um, any more pressing ones? Yeah. Okay.